For 20 years, you've trusted us to reinvent the standard in sports nutrition products. We don't plan on stopping, just like you. Peter McGuff is a living legend. When it comes to journalism and bodybuilding, many would agree that he is the greatest of all time. In many ways, he has brought a level of integrity to the way bodybuilding media is covered. During the print era, he has contributed to nearly every major bodybuilding publication, and he continues to bring his vast experience and knowledge to the sport today. I sat down with Peter in his home in Florida to discuss his take on the changes in the bodybuilding culture, the media, and the difference between the eras. My name is Peter McGough. I've been in bodybuilding journalism for the best part of 40 years. Um, I've had a terrific life doing that. I started off in England working on English magazines, gradually worked my way up to, we got an offer from Joe Weider to come and work for him. Thought I was gonna be in California for two years and 25 years later, we're still in the States. I've seen bodybuilding grow in its most sort of productive period. and I'm still watching it grow and develop. So it's been a very dynamic 40 years. How did you discover bodybuilding in the first place? Well, when I was a kid, I was very much into sports, soccer and cricket. And I was a, a good drawer, a pencil drawer. I used to draw kids in the school. I could do the caricatures. Mm -hmm. And then I saw the Superman comics and they used to have in the back Joe Weider's ads for Larry Scott, Freddie Ortiz, even before Arnold and Dave Draper. And I started to draw them. So something must have twigged in me then, although it was a few years before I went into a gym for the first time, mm -hmm. which a friend took me into. A, he'd always been trying to persuade me, it'll make you stronger. But in those days, you didn't want to be muscle bound if you were into a sport, but he took me in. I had this great workout with him. I'll always remember, this is a broken down gym in 1969. You know, there's none of the family fitness or whatever they call them, you know. And I can close my eyes and I can go back the moment I said, this is for me. I was doing press behind neck on a power rack and Steppenwolf came on the road radio with Ride Like the Wind. And I thought, I'm the real rebel here. I discovered something and off I went and I can still go back into that moment and smell, you know, the milk, because milk was our pre-workout and during workout, got it from the shop next door. And the smell of sweat, you know, that, that's what it was. So can you tell me the origins of, of bodybuilding? From what I understand, it was a guy named Eugene Sandow who actually invented it, right? From the circus kind of circuit. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, well, back in the, the, the late, uh, 1800s, what was very popular at music halls was strongman acts. But these were big bulky guys, you know, with big guts and they were doing all sorts of crazy lifts, lifting 15 people up. But Eugene Sandow came along and this is the guy who was a strength guy, very strong, did great strength, but he had abs and everything. You know, he had a physique and he had delts and he had striations. And he became a bit of a sex symbol. I mean, he was a bit of a lad on the side if you if you want to really dig into his, his, his life, he had a great time. So he, he sort of brought that, the muscular look. Yeah, it's, it's, don't want to just be bulky. You want to look like you, you, you know, you look good. And then you had people like George Hackenschmidt came along. There's another guy, strong as a bull, but had a great physique. So that's how it evolved. You know, Eugene Sandow held one of the biggest bodybuilding events ever in London. 1901, it was called the Show of Shows or something like that. 10,000 people at the Albert Hall. Um, Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes author, was one of the, uh, the judges. It was a massive event. So he, he, he placed bodybuilding competition on it and it, it sort of developed in strands from there on in. So he was the first real bodybuilder. He might have even used the term bodybuilder first. I think it was bodybuilder, it wasn't one word. Do you think, if somebody was to ask you, is bodybuilding generally healthy or unhealthy, how would you answer? It's difficult now. At, 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 at the top level, you've got two strands. You've got guys who know exactly what they're doing um, and they won't get into trouble. You've got other guys who don't, who will get into trouble. But again, it comes back to me. I think the worst 
is at the amateur level that we never hear. You know, you suddenly, you see something, somebody posts something, some guy you've never heard of who was third in the, you know, Mr. Back of wherever, mm-hmm. has died and it was because of drug-related things, bodybuilding-related things. So that's very saddening. But I still have a great connection in track and field. And I'm not pillaring anybody else, but sportsmen at the top level today in all sports, if they can improve 1%, they'll do something to improve that 1%. The, the drive is just... There's been studies, you probably know, that they've been proved to be clinically insane in, in what they want to do. They'll, you know, in Montreal Olympics, they asked half the athletes, if you had a gold medal, we guarantee you a gold medal, but you're dead in five years, what would you want? And like 80% said, I'll have the gold medal. You know, that shows the drive of all sportsmen. Even golfers are, are doing things. You know, it's, it's, it's just human nature. You know, if, I don't know. If, a, if somebody said to me, here's a magic pill to make you a better writer, which would be a good idea, by the way, um, would I be tempted? You know, you don't know, do you? Do you think the whole stigma of steroids will always prevent bodybuilding from being more popular? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's had that for since ever it started, really. Well, not since it started, but certainly since the 60s and the 70s. As I say, track and field, look at the state they're in, you know, and I, I know that from, from inside. And that's not to say, you know, to justify it in bodybuilding. I think there is abuse there. Um, the, the, I, I think that there should have been some form of steroid testing been brought in. The 1990 Olympia was drug tested with mixed results. Some guys got eliminated. Some guys were okay. Some guys were not as good as they were. But he stopped, but he stopped testing. Yeah, because the guys walked out at the Olympia. 1990, there's 20 guys lined up. Well, supposed to enter. Five of them failed the drug test, which was the results were known the day before the cut. So you didn't see those five guys. You didn't see Mohammed Benazizi. You didn't see Barry Dume. So the fan was denied these tickets. Two, two, two factions then showed up there were some guys who were nearly as good as they were before like mike christian francis bedfato and then there was other guys who'd obviously had to take a hit even lee haney who won and sean ray they lost upper body weight the wbf at the same time the world bodybuilding federation started by vince mcmahon handed out flyers at the end of that show after promising he wasn't starting a federation he was just starting a magazine and that put an end to drug testing. You know, A, the fans' appreciation was, what did we pay for? We went to see the freaks. We didn't see the freaks. And there's other groups coming along who will let those bodybuilders do what they want. So it was quietly shelved. Now, going back to Joe Weider, um, can you tell me about Joe Weider a little bit more and also maybe like, what was his vision? I mean, you knew you worked with him, you know, yeah. tell me about him as a, as a businessman. Joe's vision for bodybuilding was always artistic. It was, he was always looking at sculptures. He didn't go for the, the Herculean, you know, all the beef and everything. Guys would come and visit him, bodybuilders that had never seen him before, and he'd always want to look at them, you know, get them to pose. He would improve their posing, you know, turn that hand in, you know, flex the length of the bicep. Run from the bicep, that's what you got to do. You know, he would do this to the guys and they would be pouring with sweat. And Tom Prince, he said, I learned more in five minutes with Joe than five years of training. He was a, he was a visionary, he was an artist. He, he saw sculptures and he saw art in that. And as a businessman, he hardly ever... It's funny how you think of things afterwards when he's gone, you start to think. He hardly ever brought up money. If you went in with an idea, what's a good idea? He never said, how much is it? You know, you'd think he'd say out of interest, but he was, he was more committed to the product than the bottom line. The bottom line didn't matter to him, you know, because obviously he had loads of money and nobody could argue with him when he said, we're going to do that. But he was so accessible as, as a person, you know, to everybody in the building. He was, when I first got there, I was a writer 
editor in charge of me, he reported to an editor, editorial director, he reported to CEO, and then it was like five levels above. But he would come down and talk to you what you're working on with everybody. And I once asked him, you know, you, you, he only had a Lexus car. I know a Lexus is a nice car, but there was no chauffeur-driven Rolls Royces or anything. And um, I said, why do you, you know, you don't have the Rolls Royce. His house is a lovely house in Hancock Park, but it's, it's sort of Spanish, but it's like, I don't know, five or six bedrooms. You could walk up to the front door and knock on the door. There's no compound. Why didn't have a mansion in Beverly Hills and all the rest of it? He says, because I, I want to be accessible. I don't want people to think they can't come to me. And he would, he would mix with anybody. You know, I, I knew a guy could deliver at a coffee machine and, and Joe would end up talking to him about bodybuilding. What do you think of bodybuilding? What do you want to see in bodybuilding? You know, he was always inquisitive, you know, and he was a great inspiration and he had this eye. He could see something straight away on a cover or an image. It, Joe was an image person. You know, he wasn't into reading long articles. He, 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 not that he didn't have the attention span, just that he was so busy doing everything else. There's only been like one bodybuilder, maybe two, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Lou Ferrigno, who kind of crossed over into mainstream success and doing other things outside of bodybuilding, right? Um, right now, Kai Green possibly might be doing something to cross over, but do you think the mainstream you know, world can accept somebody who looks like a bodybuilder in the mainstream media, you know, um, playing roles, doing things, you know what I mean, and taking them seriously, actually. I think they can, and it comes back to how you present yourself. How did Arnold get on? Everybody looked at him as some sort of lunkhead with muscles, but his personality immediately came on. He didn't wait for them to give him a green light. He was firing one line as soon as, and oh, this guy's got a brain, he's got a sense of humor. We'll have him on again on the Merv Griffin show. Don't go on though with this. I'm a little bodybuilder, you know, make fun of me. No, it, 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 we need outgoing guys. And, and, and too often, I think the guys are satisfied with being a star in, in this world, this bodybuilding world, that it's, and they put so much into it that they don't see the significance in going outside of it. But if somebody with the right personality comes along, as Arnold proved, you know, you can break through and you know there's lots of uh, i mean kai's making breakthroughs you know there's lots of guys out there with lots of personality that could be cultivated to do things like that but there's no you know even in the weeder days i always used to say well we've got this stable of athletes we probably had of the top 15 athletes in the world we had 12 under contract why aren't we getting them on television? Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we sending them out for parts? Why isn't there a program to spread this word? We've got this talent. And some of them, you know, are very forceful personalities that would come along very well. But it, there's always this, we're not worthy somehow. You know, it's strange. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, you're really welcome. appreciate it. Great interview. Yeah.